Hello and welcome to the Weekly Defence Podcast, the show about defence procurement and military technology. I am your host, Richard Thomas, Senior Editor Naval, and on the show this week we talk to software supplier Aerogility about its cloud-based predictive maintenance and forecasting solutions, and we grab a chat with our simulation and training editor on the recent developments and technologies in his field. But first, the headlines from this week. And we start in the US, where we report that the initial batch of prototype infantry support vehicles, ISVs, is scheduled for delivery to the US Army for testing on the 26th of October. Prime contractor GM Defense will hand over nine vehicles to the US Army for testing. Six ISVs will be delivered to Aberdeen Test Center in Maryland, one to Yuma Test Center in Arizona, and two more to Fort Bragg in North Carolina for low-velocity airdrop testing. The US Army is buying 649 ISVs to equip 11 infantry brigade combat teams by fiscal year 2024. Also in the state, the US Air Force has awarded Raytheon Missiles and Defense a contract for Lot 6 production of Stormbreaker Precision Guided Glide Bombs. FMS customers will account for 6.3% of the contract value, although Shepard's Defense Insight notes that there are no confirmed exports yet of Stormbreaker. Last week, the US Air Force Air Combat Command approved the use of Stormbreaker on F-15E Strike Eagles, and the weapon will also be fielded on the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter and US Navy Super Hornets. On to naval news now, and Russia is assessing the results of the latest test firing of the Zircon hypersonic missile from the frigate Admiral Gorshkov. The missile reportedly hit a target 450 kilometers away at a speed exceeding Mach 8, flying at a maximum altitude of 28 kilometers with a flight time of four and a half minutes. This hypersonic missile is accelerated by a solid propellant booster to supersonic speeds required to activate the ramjet or scramjet engine. If the missile did reach a speed of Mach 8, it can be assumed that a scramjet was used. Russia aims to test fire Zircon from a submarine for the first time next year, although this timetable may be over-optimistic. In Europe, a year on from the ceremonial steel cutting of the future FNS Amaral Renard, the lead ship of the planned FDI frigates destined for the French Navy, Manufacturing Naval Group still plans to deliver the frigate in 2023, despite the pressures brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. The new class of light frigates is intended to complement the larger Horizon and Frem class frigates serving with the French Navy, and if delivered to design, should be capable of performing AAW, ASW, and anti-submarine warfare duties. So that was a taste of some of the copy that came across our desks this week. Time now to go in-depth, so it's also time to extend a warm podcast welcome in these autumnal days to news editor Ben Vogel, air editor Tim Martin, and land reporter Flavik kamagas Hello to everyone. Hi there, Richard. Hi, Rich. Hello. Richard, yeah, I, I'd like to ask you a couple more questions about the uh, the FDI story. Um, firstly, wh- where does it fit into the French Navy of the future? What's its place yeah, it's a very, 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 very uh, straightforward question, very straightforward answer as well. It's it's part of a wider program uh, that will see the French Navy or the Marine Nationale uh, field 15 major surface combatants by by 2030. So the, these five uh, very, very capable light frigates should be delivered by then. So that's between 2023 and 2030. And uh, being, being a new vessel, I expect there are a number of uh, unique and uh, so-called cutting-edge design features to the FDI. No, indeed, it's a really interesting looking vessel. Um, the the in in terms of looks, the FDI will be built with an inverted uh, uh, bow and hull form, which sort of maximizes below deck space and aids in the hull cutting through the the water. But one potential downside, uh, possibly, is that the foredeck of a design such as that. Not saying that this uh, particular frigate will suffer from this, but those. Uh, designed similar, similar to this, with an inverted uh, bow and bow and hull form, um, the foredecks can get swamped in in uh, heavy seas. So that's probably something to 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 just bear in mind. Just to give you a quick idea of the equipment, it's very very uh, highly equipped platform, a small platform. So you've got um, Tala Sea Fire radar, uh, IFF sonar systems. You've got Leonardo seventy six millimeter main gun. You have IX. Blue Navigation Center, MCU diesels, so a traditional uh, a, a, a traditional Kodad configuration. You've got next to Narwhal 20 mil secondary guns, hull-mounted sonar, Captus 4 towed sonar array. Uh, you have XSET Block 3 missiles, a 16-cell VLS capability. Um, so you've got a full-spectrum light 
light frigates, uh, unlike some of the uh, the uh, neighbouring counterparts, really. So this is a quite an extensive programme. Has there been any impact of COVID on the construction programme so far? Yeah, well, so I, I, I sat in on a, a, a briefing um, that Naval Group held about the programme, and they said there were there were some small impacts, but obviously that they they weren't enough to to impact the potential delivery uh, of the first in class by twenty twenty three, and that any any COVID related delays uh, will be caught up during the lifetime of the programme. So by the time twenty thirty comes around, any delays that had been uh, brought up because of COVID will have been will have been uh, will have been taken care of by then. But obviously, it has to be delivered by twenty thirty because it's an absolutely vital part of the Horizon twenty thirty target. I suppose a clue's in the name, isn't it? Yeah. Um, in terms of exporting this frigate, there there must be a a, a bit of a push, perhaps, from uh, French industry to uh, to sell this frigate to to other navies. Absolutely, absolutely, it's trying to push it uh, in many of the same directions that some of uh, the light frigate rivals are also being pushed forward to. So you're obviously looking at, say, Bulgaria and places like Greece. Greece is an interesting one because they actually had uh, a fairly formal uh, arrangement with France to kind of procure two frigates from France. Not saying it would have been the FDI class, but two frigates. So in October 2019, uh, AFP actually reported at the time that Greece had formalised its intent in purchasing two French frigates with a letter of intent. Uh, Again, we thought that the design would probably be the FDI, which is also known as the Belhara in its export form. Um, but negotiations in, in, in recent months looks like they've slowed uh, between France and Greece. Uh, naval group officials moved only to state that bilateral discussions between the two countries were ongoing uh, regarding uh, potential acquisition. But, you know, Greece is, is clearly in need of newer platforms, though, because its, its major surface combatants right now are either at the end or halfway through the service life. Um, so that's time 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 is pressing there. It also has, has to be... Um, taking into account that the Eastern Mediterranean right now is not a very stable place. You've got uh, tensions uh, between Greece and Turkey as Ankara looks to uh, expand and exploit some oil drilling in the region. And don't forget, 19th of October saw the election of Ersin Tatar in Turkish-controlled northern Cyprus with strong backing from the Turkish president. Um, So that's probably placed a renewed emphasis in Athens to regenerate its uh, fairly fairly aging surface fleet. Thank you, Richard. That's one to keep an eye on for sure. Yeah, thanks, Ben. On to the air now. A fresh copy in from you, Tim, and I think it's Saab's most recent financial results. Any Anything in there that might impact Gripen or, or, or other things in the air domain? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, first and foremost, uh, it's, it's worth talking about Gripen plans because there's supply chain difficulties that have been uh, outlined by Saab's uh, new president and CEO, uh, Mikhail Johansson. Uh, so he was he, he gave a very frank account of, of what's happening on the program and the fact that uh, Gripen has uh, had to undergo you know fundamental reassessment in light of COVID-19 and the company have also SAV have also turned to new suppliers uh, in terms of implementing uh, mitigating actions to kind of uh, stave off uh, COVID related issues. I think not only is that very interesting in and of itself, but also because six months ago um, you had uh, a previous financial re- report and uh, assessment from Saab that said that they weren't feeling any immediate consequences. That was that was their uh, perspective some time ago. Well, lo and behold, we're now you know some way down the track, and there is most definitely some economic pain that's that's being felt here and. Um, some difficulties on the the grip and side of things. Uh, are, are there any impacts to to suppliers for the for the gripping program? Yeah. So as I, as I mentioned just briefly, yeah, they they have um, they have turned to uh, a number of new suppliers to to, to support them. Um, the the difficulty in trying to get a. a a read on the the full extent of how many uh, new suppliers are involved. Um, it's it's not really possible. Johansson didn't actually you know specify how many. I did reach out to Saab to you know ask you know which components are worst affected, and um, they said that they you know they they can't uh, provide any details on that. So uh, we're a little in the dark as to you know how many component changes uh, specifically are uh, have been changed, but. 
ultimately, and as Johansson said, the the consequence of that and the, the reevaluation of things is that that means that new parts will have to be um, newly um, verified and uh, you know retested, and that brings about you know a bit of a headache then when you're looking to um, make long term planning for deliveries and, and things of that nature, um, so. I think that's probably you know the the most um, salient point to be made here. Uh, he also did mention when it comes to disruption, uh, he said that you have to also consider the fact that um, the exchange of sensitive sensitive information um, when working on software developments, uh, you know, has to be considered here. And there's there's a number of dependencies uh, in that regard uh, that are difficult to to. Uh, keep on top of. So beyond that, he also said that Saab look at the development of Gripen from um, basically two parallel efforts, which is the supply chain and the you know the, the simple things that we think about, which is getting the parts uh, handed over so that you can have final assembly. That's one part of it. He said the second is that uh, and he called it uh, incremental. Uh, increasing incremental functionality of systems. Um, and, you know, that to me, I, I take it as in testing. Effectively, you've got to give time to, to test these things. So those those two kind of lines of effort are basically a, going through a bit of a, a struggle at, at the moment. And uh, particularly, they can't get in contact and have obviously face-to-face -face meetings with their suppliers who are providing software and look at those uh, sensitive issues. Clearly, that's you know, going, that's not that problem is not going to go away. And um, while we're in uh, virtual meetings and all the rest of it, that that looks to be um, something that's going to be here to stay. And um, you know, that might ultimately the suppliers' uh, supply chain uh, changes uh, might also lead to a potential you know standstill in production, which would be the ultimate uh, problem, of course. Here, I mean, Gripen is a flagship program for for Saab has been for a long time um, and it's obviously trying to push the platform into a number of different directions in terms of opportunities for for sales and exports but will, will, will these issues well could these issues have any impact on uh, existing business prospects or even new business prospects down down further down the line Johansson was fairly categorical in, in that regard in the, that regard because he said that there would be Absolutely no problem for Saab in supporting current customers and delivering uh, aircraft uh, and meeting you know contractual arrangements. I suppose what mi what was missing from what he said was whether discussions are ongoing now to uh, confirm if deliveries are going to slip, if there's going to be any delays. Um, because you know you 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 could being generous, you could meet your customers. Uh expectations uh, but at the same time you could also be in discussions with them to to arrange and suggest that deliveries will have to be delayed by by two or three months so that key word of delay was was not mentioned by Sab, and you know perhaps that is significant as well but as we know just on the program itself uh, and as you mentioned future opportunities Sab are on contract for 60 grip and e variants with sweden uh, and 30 and a mixed fleet of uh, ef the single being the e configuration and the f being the the twin seat uh, for 36 units and then they have uh they're hopeful of securing additional business uh, with uh, Canada and Finland being involved in those countries' uh, respective uh, fighter campaigns. Yep, interesting. Thanks, Tim. We'll just wait and watch on that one. Flavia, welcome welcome back to the show. Um, uh, this week you listened to a UK Defence Committee providing some updates on, on ground programmes. So what more do we need to know? Uh, this week, the, the some members of the, the British Ministry of Defence, they had a meeting with the Defence Committee and uh, they have presented an update on the main ground programmes of the Army. Uh, they spoke about the progress in delivering the British Army armoured vehicle capabilities. Uh, the members of the Defense Committee, they expressed concern about the increase in age uh, and obsolescence of the British Armed Fleet. 
Uh, they spoke about the warrior, that's a capability from the 80s, the challenger, that's from the 90s. And they also expressed uh, concern related to, uh, to the AFV 430 Bulldog, that's a capability from the 60s. Um, it was stressed uh, during this meeting that the Ministry of Defense intends to replace the Bulldog through the Armored Support Vehicle Program, but this replacement won't be a priority and it's likely to happen over the next 10 years. Actually, the Fox uh, of the meeting was on the main programs that the, the MOD is currently running, uh, the upgrade of the Warrior and the Challenger 2, and uh, the Boxer and Ajax programs. Yeah, it's a perennial question, but I have to ask it really. I mean, any news on the, the deadlines for these major programs that you just mentioned? Actually, the Ministry for Defense Procurement, he could not disclose details about the deadlines uh, of these programs. He explained that uh, the government is conducting the integrated review of security, defense, development and foreign policy. And this review... Uh, will define the the long term strategic aims over the the next decade, and also will define the capabilities that the armed forces uh, will demand to perform the tasks that. Uh, are expected from then in the next decade. Um, in the case of the main programs, the the Minister of Defense expects to move uh, into a contract for the next year to upgrade the Challenger 2 to the uh, Challenger 3 version. And regarding the Boxer program, the construction of the assembly facility in Telford uh, where the platform will be built, it's moving forward as expected. He also stressed that the FOX of the, the MOD will be to improve the commonality of the new platforms and uh, to ensure the, the, the interoperability with the platforms that are currently in service with the Army. Uh, this, this commonality, it will bring uh, advantages for the, the both the MOD and the Army in terms of supply, uh, training, and true life service of the vehicles. I mean, commonality and British Army are, are, are not sort of words that really go together very often. I mean, you've got, blimey, you've got uh, you've got things like Mastiff, Foxhound, Challenger, Warrior, Ajax. I mean, these these are these are all very disparate platforms procured over a bunch of different decades. So. How 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 is the MOD going to improve commonality? Because that seems like a tall order. Uh, Richard, actually, the army has thirty five types of vehicles, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. the MOD plans uh, to operate only 15 types. Uh, the aim is to ensure the interoperability and modularity between these platforms, but. It will, it will be improved uh, with the future uh, platforms of the Army. They will benefit from a much greater degree of commonality across the different types. Uh, for example, the Boxer and the Ajax, they will have the same engines that's produced, manufactured by MTU. And also the, the Minister of Defense is looking at a common canon system, which will, be, which will be used across multiple types of vehicles. That's interesting. I wonder if the CT40 has got any got anything to say there. Uh, thanks, Flavia. Thanks, everyone. Um, for our listeners, if you'd like to, to find out more about the stories discussed in this episode and, and, and more, please visit our website, shepherdmedia.com forward slash news. Coming up next, multimedia journalist Noemi Di Stefano talks to simulation and training editor, Trevor Nash about current programs, recent technologies and platforms in the market. We are falling further and further behind. Word documents are not far from handwritten letters passed in the Civil War. Now the challenge is, well, how do you do that if you don't have your centralized command and control, if your logistics are contested, if your communications are being jammed? Adversaries have figured out our game plan and are engineering asymmetric ways to interfere with that whole system. 
In the chaos of combat, warfighters need fast, secure communications and instant access to information. However, the digital information age we know today has changed the nature of warfare across all domains. Military commanders are acutely aware that new networks, systems and technologies are needed to ensure timely and effective communications. This is Shepherd Studios podcast series on Five Eyes Connectivity, sponsored by our partner Viasat. In series one, we looked at connectivity issues facing the Five Eyes grouping of countries. For this second series, we're diving further into these issues, speaking to senior military leaders about the work underway to ensure military communication networks can withstand the expected threats of tomorrow. In this opening episode, we look at the connectivity issues facing the US military and its further development of the multi-domain operations concept. Many of the technological and operational advances that will be demanded in the JDO battlefield are aspirational, and there's a chasm between today's reality and long-term goals. How can the US and its allies make this transition? To learn more about Shepherd Studios' podcast series on Five Eyes Connectivity, a link will be provided in the show notes. Until next time. Artificial intelligence, augmented reality and mixed reality have disrupted the world of simulation and training, introducing alternatives to live sessions for militaries around the globe. And in future, we can expect military training to continue to leverage more cutting-edge technologies. To delve into the latest developments, programs and updates from the past few weeks and months, we turn to Trevor Nash, Simulation and Training Editor here at Shepherd Media. Trevor, welcome to the podcast. Naomi, good to see you again. So uh, we've got a couple of interesting topics to discuss today. Uh, let's start with the first one, tailored training. So maybe a few listeners are familiar with this notion. Maybe some of them are not. So can we give a definition of what tailored training is? Okay. Um, well, I'm going to be a bit of a politician, actually, Naomi. And what I'm going to do first is, is put training into context and Historically, you know, training really hasn't evolved too much since the Second World War. Um, it basically sees a group of students placed in a classroom and all were subjected to chalk and talk by the instructor, where he imparted his or her knowledge, uh, which matched a defined syllabus. If you look at pilot training, for example, students are still flying the same number of training hours, and generally, although there are exceptions, notably, I suppose, Sweden and, and, and Switzerland, um, they're using three aircraft in three phases of training, exactly the same as they were 80 years ago. But tailored training is, is, is different. The, the old way of doing things was very much a linear process where the cohort students move through the training pipeline together. And air forces are now looking how to tailor that training to individual needs. Now, unlike a politician, I'm going to come back to your question. So what I mean by tailored training is that students no longer have to go through that same syllabus together. You can actually take out the brighter student uh, who can progress more quickly, or the person that's having a problem picking up certain aspects of the course can be given extra training. And an example of that is currently underway in the United States of America, and it's called Pilot Training Next. And it's an experiment that has demonstrated how fast jet pilots uh, can either speed up their training um, to save cost and save aircraft types they're flying on, or indeed, if they need a little bit more in certain areas, that's how it develops. And of course, with most things now, we use a lot of artificial intelligence for that. And as an example, CAE have won uh, part of that program um, with their CAE Tracks Academy uh, simulator which looks at the, the pilot, student pilot, how that person's training and says, okay, you know, this is really good. You maybe need a little bit more here, a bit less there. And it tailors the training to that individual. And as, as the industry is now moving away from this standard form of training, can we maybe talk a little bit more in depth about new programs that are currently available out there, uh, new programs and new technologies, of course? 
Uh, well, the CAE's, uh, CAE's Tracks Academy is a good example of one of the systems out there. And fundamentally, uh, all of the products that are out there, and there aren't too many at the moment, a lot of the big companies have been developing similar low-cost trainers. But the real uh, success with these devices is not so much the front-end displays um, and the man-machine interfaces. It's more behind the scenes in terms of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence in the U.S. is massive. I mean, even within this last week, there were major investments by the U.S. Department of Defense. Four companies were given what was called a blanket purchase agreement, or BPA, to provide services to the Department of Defense's joint Artificial Intelligence Center Missions Directorate. So this just goes to show how the United States is embracing AI and how that um, embracing of, of the technology is helping us in the training community. And um, these forms of uh, training, are they suitable to all trainees, to, for example, uh, the so-called uh, ab initio trainees, the beginners, or to maybe more experienced uh, pilots? Um, Are they suitable to everyone? Is one size fit all or not? F fundamentally, what we're looking at here is the ab initio set phase of training, the early stage training of pilots, where they can use these simulators to, as I say, be, be monitored and then better stream them for the next phase of training. And there's a lot of experimentation going on in the United States at the moment. And Amazingly, the, the, the United States are cutting out one phase of their training at an experimental stage at, at the moment by going straight from the T-6 turboprop aeroplane to their frontline fighter, F-16, F-15, F-35, removing the T-38 supersonic uh, lead-in fighter trainer from that process. And this is the power of simulation at this very early stage. So it's aimed at that ab initio Um, student, the new student, and it seems at the moment to be very successful. And does the, this specific uh, CAE program have like multiple stages of training? Yes and no as part of the current syllabus, but fundamentally it needs to be looked at in, in the round where PTN um, is actually compressing or trying to compress that training process. The big issue at the moment with the United States is they're around about 2,000 fast jet pilots short. And so this experimentation program seems to be showing some success at the moment. Okay, I'm sure you will keep our listeners up to date with this program. And uh, let's now move on to the next topic, which is uh, physiological monitoring, uh, a process that I understand um, uses neurological technology. Um, so can you maybe outline what physiological monitoring is and what new programs are out there that are um, implementing um, and delivering these uh, technologies? Um, so some students, well, we all learn in different ways, don't we? So some of us are fast learners. Some of us need visual stimulation or all stimulation to help us learn. But we all learn at different rates. Um, some of us find it easy. Some of us don't. So one way of monitoring the stress levels of students during training is to monitor things like heart rates, brain activity, blood pressure or perspiration, sort of four examples there. Um, And this, this ability to measure the brain activity in real time and then use that data to drive training decisions uh, is quite an amazing facility. So let me give you an example of that. Um, you and I, Naomi, are on the range and we're firing our annual personal weapons test. Mm -hmm. And um, you're quite a good shot. And you are being monitored Your heart rate is normal, perspiration is normal, brain activity is normal, and you're getting a very successful um, exercise being completed. I, on the other hand, terrible shot. My heart rate's up. I'm perspiring. I've got a massive issue with, you know, my brain is all over the place, and I'm not shooting very well. Now, that gives the instructor a great view of why you fired well and I didn't fire well. And that can be used in assessing how further training is given. And I might be needed to give some remedial training because it may not just be the fact 
that uh, I'm a bad shot. In fact, I may be a very good shot, but maybe I'm getting stressed out on the range. Maybe I had a heavy night the night before. And it's, it's another tool to allow uh, instructors to monitor their students so that, again, they can tailor the training that's on offer to them. There are quite a few companies working on this now. Cubic um, has been working on it for a number of years in their combat training, laser-based combat training centers. But they've been doing it uh, by monitoring heart rate and sleep levels. And that was part of um, a study primarily aimed at safety issues. Uh, but what they're doing now, they're using that data for safety still, but they're also using it um, to look at performance levels of various soldiers on, on the range. Another couple of companies, California-based companies, um, Clay Strategic Designs and Conero, are also doing similar things again. And it, it's quite interesting. Although this concept has been with us for some time, there now seems to be real traction with quite a few companies you know, stepping up to the plate and doing proper research into how we monitor people during training. So basically, there are there is a, a data collection process in, in a way that then um, further training is tailored to on the basis of those um, data results. Is that is that yeah. fair to say? And um, where is the industry going? Moving, you know. If, you, if we look at the future, can we expect um, next steps in this kind of training? I, I would say definitely yes, because the benefit is if you're doing a training task and I'm monitoring your physiological output, and for instance, the task is quite complex, but I might see you doing the task really easily in terms of you know no stressful output. I can then, as an instructor, increase the complexity of the tasks that I'm giving you. So I'm really stretching you, and so you will get better training. Conversely, if you're not doing too well, and I can see you very, very stressed, heart rate going through the ceiling, blood pressure going up, I can then maybe reduce the complexity of the task. So what we're trying to do is to match that training, because we never want to overwhelm somebody in training and give them so many complex tasks one after another where they can't achieve the, the training outcome for that particular task. So it's, it, it's a great way of adding yet, yet another thing. So again, w although it's using physiological methods, it's still doing what we were talking about earlier, and that is tailoring the training. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's move to the last topic for today, which is olfactory stimulations. I have to say, I, I was looking forward to talk to you about this. <laughs> it uh, gives me the impression that we are talking about a sort of like 4D training, you know, like in movies where we got uh, this uh, sensation. So what, um, I guess, not what olfactory stimulation is, but how does olfactory stimulation enhance the training? Is it an add-on feature? Um, it, it, it is an add-on feature. I am really surprised that it hasn't been used as much as it could have been in the past. You know, I, I spent 16 years in the army, and um, when I was out in the field or on operations, um, the, the olfactory stimulation, the sense of smell, is there all the time. You know, you walk through a village, there could be, you know, cooking, you know, smelling rubbish tips, bonfire. Horrifically, sometimes, you know, dead bodies, livestock smells, you know, by going by farm. So as the soldier moves through that environment, he might also pick up the smell of cigarette smoke. Hello, that's unusual. Where's that coming from? So it's another sensory stimulation, really. Cubic has demonstrated this a couple of years ago on a virtual small arms trainer, which was basically a walkthrough of a village. And it was demonstrated at ITSEC. And basically, the soldiers walking through the simulator were using helmet-mounted displays to see the, the image. It was very successful, but it doesn't seem to have been taken on further. Um, continuing this ground uh, use of olfactory stimulation for ground simulation, a uh, UK company, very successful at the moment, 4GD, they have... Uh, a simulation system called Smart Facility, which is available 
fundamentally in four different levels. And in one of those levels, there is olfactory stimulation to give the users who are being trained in close quarter battle skills the same sort of smells that I highlighted earlier through walking through the village. I saw you wrote a story about um, this um, 4GD smart facilities and, and, and you talk in your story about the four levels training experience. What is the difference between these uh, four levels? Um, f- fundamentally, what 4GD are doing, they're, they're offering um, close quarter battle skills trainers from just below platoon level. So, you know, around about 30 people. And basically, they, they offer a range of training where the client can go in for a relatively small, more cost-effective approach to it, to very high-grade, complex facilities with the olfactory stimulation, with video recording of the exercise, with sound, with smoke, with lights. Um, so it's it's an incredibly um, good low-level system which can be deployed in the unit's barracks to carry out that sort of training. You've said that olfactory stimulation has not been largely adopted in the industry. So if maybe I'm just putting you on the spot a little bit, but do you think it is really, so what is the advantage of adding um, this sense? That's a very good question. Um, If you get into the cockpit of a faster aeroplane, there's an immediate smell to that cockpit. It's a smell of hot electronics. Um, often a smell of vomit, frequently a smell of um, stale body odor. There's a smell of the metal, smell of the fuel, um, smell of hydraulics often. And that comes with a real aeroplane, a real cockpit. To have that smell in a simulator, in my opinion, adds for very little cost a massive ability to immerse that student in the the simulator, thinking it's a real aircraft. It just adds another layer of uh, immersiveness, another layer of realism to the training task. So I think for a relatively low cost, um, olfactory stimulation is the way to go. Okay, that's all very interesting. I could talk about this for another hour probably, but uh, that's all we have time for today. So Trevor, thank you very much. Naomi, thank you very much indeed. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. And if you roll right the way back to that sort of 1950s, 1960s, early 70s, the UK was really at the cutting edge of space and space launch and every aspect. And now we're getting back there again. How do you weigh lunar sample in a weightless environment? How do you test for water on the tip of a drill bit on the moon when you're back on Earth? Our ability to be part of that programme is absolutely fascinating. The UK space sector has seen rapid development in recent decades, with a total income of about £15 billion and generating more than 40,000 jobs. The industry and its government partners have identified significant room for growth in the coming years, fuelled by domestic investment and international programmes. However, the sector faces a number of challenges. How can it recruit the people it needs when there's a widespread shortfall of STEM-focused employees? How can it support education across the board, from primary level to university students? And what will be the impact of leaving the European Union? Welcome to episode two of the Defining the Future podcast, Shepherd Studios series on aerospace and defence innovation, sponsored by our partner Raytheon UK, a company invested in Britain, creating British jobs and supporting local communities around the UK. To learn more about the transformation underway across the UK space sector, listen to the Defining the Future podcast, available now wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Shepherds, our editor, Tim Martin, and I'm delighted to say I'm joined on the line by Nigel Yard, Head of Defence uh, Solutions at our agility uh, software maintenance supplier. Um, and we're going to be discussing AI and predictive maintenance in the main, uh, Nigel. So thanks for joining us and uh, welcome to the, the Shepherds Weekly Defence Podcast. Thank you very much. 
And so, yeah, before we um, get into the, the crux of AI and all the rest of it, I understand that, yeah, you started working with Aerogility in March. I'm sure that must have been jumping in at the deep end, so to speak, and given what we've, we've had with, with COVID, how have you settled into the, to the job? Well, I, I started in January, so I had two months at least of normality before, um, before the world changed. In many ways, the, um, I've not, I've, yeah, most of our customers uh, have adapted really quickly, which is good. As a company, we're all home-based anyway, so working at home, staring into a screen is, is normal for us. It would be just nice to get back to uh, meeting people face-to-face. In fact, we had our first face-to-face meeting with a customer two weeks ago for the first time since March. So um, uh, maybe there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And in terms of um, model-driven AI, and I mean, listeners will be familiar with the, the concept broadly, but would you like to break it down a little bit more or... Give us a sense of uh, the scale at which our agility are working at the moment on, on the defence side. Okay, let's just start with model-driven AI because AI is, um, I think, is just used, used and abused term now, and it covers many different things. So, um, model-driven AI is a is a particular branch where actually we don't just yeah suck in a whole bunch of data and look for patterns, right? We build. We build models consisting of agents, and those agents represent things in your maintenance operation or your broader enterprise. So the agents could represent uh, a maintenance facility, but it could also be people, it could be processes, it could be anything that's in that operation. And what they do is they sort of interact together to try and solve a particular problem. Now, when I mean interact, I mean... They can cooperate, they can compete, they can negotiate, they can do anything. And you can ask a whole set of different questions of them. Okay, So it's not a one-question capability. And each of those agents operates uh, to its own rules. um, It has some seed data. So, for example, on an aircraft, you'd want to know how many hours, yeah, that, aircraft has on it in terms of its components and things for for maintenance and you give them a set of aims and objectives so i want to minimize cost i want to maximize operational availability so if you were a um so if you're the 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 platform the aircraft you would have a different set of aims and objectives than if you were the finance director in a company providing those services so that's where the negotiation, cooperation, competition comes comes around. And you basically let those agents play uh, and see what sort of outcomes yeah, emerge from that scenario. And is it maybe a little bit of a silver lining then that I guess the working environment that we're all involved in, everything's happening virtually and remotely. Um, are customers impacted too much um, in terms of wanting to test and, and trial um, your services and, and the agents, as you mentioned? What is the, the process for that? So in terms of, in terms of testing it, I think the, um, because of the nature and the agents, right, and we actually run these scenarios, the main way that customers use to basically say, is this actually working for me? Am I getting uh, sort of results I expect? What we generally do is run a scenario in the past. So we led all of these agents representing all sorts of different types of things in our customers' organization. We let them run together and do all their stuff. And then we can see what they recommend. And we can see what the range of outcomes could be. And you simply compare that to reality because it occurred in the past. So in terms of this, we consider this and so do our, our customers to be safe and trusted in that respect. So you can actually say, this gave me a result that I was expecting because I can compare it to the past. But also you can look inside the system and see what these agents were doing, why they took decisions. So what this does is it's not a black box AI where it gets fed lots of data, it comes up with something and you need a PhD in computer science to work out what happened. Business users can look into this and go, yeah, I understand why it took those decisions and that seems reasonable to me. So in that respect, that carries on. We can do that remotely. Um, there hasn't really been much of an issue for us. 
Yeah, so the, there's spy signs that there's strong oversight for the customer and they, they can see, they have a, a firm sense of, of what's going on yeah. and, and how um, the AI is uh, working, not just what the results are saying. Yeah, because this is um, because this is used for huge investments, right, over very long periods of time. They're not going to just accept yeah, their agency or what it's found to be the right answer. So, for instance, we're used on the biggest defense program on the planet, right, to plan out huge upgrade activities over the next 50 years, that level of investment is being based on the outputs from their agility. And um, because we can have this, you know, this safe and trusted approach, then it is trusted. It is trusted by those organizations and other ones to um, to give them the results they want. Yeah, I mean, and you, you mentioned their, um, the, the biggest defense program on the planet, and that's the, the <laughs> F-35 for anyone that's out of the loop on that one. Um, but I mean, the F-35, as we know, had, you know, processes vast swathes of data. Um, and yeah, what, can you tell us what exactly Lockheed Martin are looking to tweak or in terms of the, the, the process that you're talking about and, and um, making changes or future um, growth capabilities? What exactly is the plan in that respect? Okay, so I'll, um, I'll use one use case because it, it can get a bit complicated. So um, if we restrict this, I won't use maintenance exactly. I'll use the upgrade program. So um, this is a multi-nation platform. There's going to be thousands of aircraft. There is a significant upgrade program that's in place, both to meet an evolving operational need for all these customers, to meet role-specific fits, and bluntly to fix some of the issues <laughs> that existed on the platform. So we're looking at, and they are looking at now, fleet sizes of thousands, an upgrade program that costs tens and tens of billions of dollars over a 20 to 30 year horizon. And the simple question is, both inside Lockheed Martin and when they are working with the, um, the US Air Force and Marine Corps and things, in terms of, you know, what is the best way of dealing with upgrading the aircraft to meet a particular need? There's so many different parameters in this, so many different combinations. It's beyond a human, and it's beyond actual sort of just looking to the past to see what the future might be. So what I mean by that is the past for, for Lockheed and this program was 500 aircraft fleet. Well, actually, how you deal with a 500 aircraft fleet for maybe two customers isn't the same as how you deal with a 5,000 aircraft fleet for... 20 customers. So the past is no indication of the present. They're using it both in negotiation with what the program should be. So we've just gone through with them the um, the block four uh, upgrade. Block five is coming down the line, which is going to be much bigger. So they're using our agility to work out with the, uh, the joint program office what the upgrade program should be, what it should look like, what's the sequencing, how much it will cost. And then eventually those ripple through into um, into detailed planning about, okay, well, I know the size, shape, and fit at a fairly high level. What does that now mean in terms of real activities on the ground, real responses to social distancing on the on the on the line? And I mean, what challenges does bigger fleets specifically have for the, the agents themselves? I mean, does it is this come down to computing uh, power then and capacity? And the bigger the fleet, then, um, you know, the, the more difficult it is, or would that be, a, you know, an equivalence that, that makes sense? Well, well, clearly, as the scenarios get bigger, there, there is a demand on processing. We're moving to an approach on, on the cloud where we can basically scale the processing for the demand. So that ceases to really become an issue. It's really about understanding what your options are, right, when you have this number and a whole bunch of competing aims and objectives. So you're now facing questions not about just optimizing the um, optimizing the sort of flow through a maintenance facility, but how many maintenance facilities do you want? Where should they be? Uh, how big should they be? There's a whole raft of other questions that come in, and there's no historical precedent to actually work that out. So these agents representing these things with their aims and objectives are all trying to work that out between themselves. 
Mm-hmm. And how big a job then is training and support? Um, I mean, if you want to keep using the F-35 example, that, that might be a good one, but or, or just in general terms, if, if you're talking smaller fleets. In terms of in terms of using the the you know, air agility itself, we've just gone through a major upgrade which makes the whole UI easier to use. So that's made it easier for us. But in terms of getting to grips with the tool itself, it's it's relatively straightforward. Now, the next level beyond that is where yeah, customers, and this is the customers because this is their IP that's being built into the models. Okay. So yeah, we're always really conscious of, of of that, um, we often do the training for yeah in, uh, for customers on their models, and that gets a bit more sophisticated because now you have a, a sort of broader thing to look at. Having said that, the uh, uh, because these agents represent entities within the organisation that people recognise, it's not an abstract thing. So they recognise that a maintenance facility, you know, operates like this, and these are the parameters, and these are the constraints. That's their world. So all we're doing is helping them understand in the virtual world what their real world already looks like. So we don't tend to find this this difficult. We've just held a, um, you know, we've had to shift all of our training on yeah, online or virtual. I thought that was going to be a bit of a challenge, but actually it's been relatively straightforward. So we've just had another another big client, UK client. We've just done some training for for brand new people to air agility and um, the the virtual version got straight five out of fives on the feedback form. So obviously that seems to have worked. Would, would you like to give us a scoop and tell us who that UK customer is? It's uh, Rolls-Royce. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. So, um, so Rolls-Royce are, are a, a good example for this because when you have the model, we normally start in one place because there's a one problem to solve, okay? But yeah, once you, once you have the model, then suddenly there's a whole bunch of other questions and problems that you can solve with very little additional investment because the model exists. So Rolls-Royce are pretty sort of pioneering in this, but now it's become a a fairly broad sort of decision-making and forecasting capability across the whole life cycle of their of their products. So they use it in the in the bidding stage, they use it to work with their customers when there's a um, a change to the status quo in the operational demand. So, okay, well, you want to use it a slightly different way, so we'll see what the impact is. And obviously, they're using it in the in the sort of sustainment end and, and, and maintenance and upgrades. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in terms of um, you know maintenance downtime obviously being critical and AI reducing workload, I suppose those have always kind of been the big variables um, that I guess from an industry side, have been, I guess, difficult to, to, to square on some occasions. Um, and so is there anything from a, a, a technical point of view that in the next five or 10 years, our agility might look at to kind of to address those concerns as well, beyond what we're talking about here, the agents and AI, or would it be just a matter of almost just tinkering with, with what you have uh, at the moment? I don't think the uh, I don't think in in the five year horizon there'll be something that fundamentally changes it. We have two professors; they're both effectively you know, preeminent AI professors in the UK, and they both describe model based or agent based uh, AI as the next generation of AI because the next generation is we're going to use it in applications that are really, really, really important. I know some of these are coming along like the uh, the autonomous driving and things, but what our customers are doing are basing hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investments on what we're saying. So the fact that actually they call it safe and trusted, that means that actually you can, an average person can actually understand why the model has made a decision it has. So it's it's explicable in that respect. So some AIs, you could do it if you have a PhD in computer science and you can delve inside the black box. But fundamentally, you just go, well, that's what it said, so that's what we do. The, the safe and trusted allows you to actually understand why it's made those decisions. So in that respect, you can take AI into a whole bunch of applications that you can't take some other forms of AI. 
Nigel, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, we look forward to, to catching up with you and, and maybe some later company updates in the future. Thanks again. Thank you very much. You've been listening to another episode of the Weekly Defence Podcast. As always, a big thanks to everyone who took the time in being with us today. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed the show, make sure you like and subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast. Shepherd Media is also offering a 20% discount for annual subscription to Premium News. Head over to shepherdmedia.com forward slash subscribe and insert code PODCAST20 to redeem, which is valid until the 31st of December 2020. Until next week, thanks for listening. Thank you.